Hey guys, what's up? What's going on? Welcome back to another one of my videos. If you are new, what's up? My name is Megan. And if you are returning to part two to this series and you're coming from my previous video, or if you're just coming because you're a part of the fam here, thank you guys so much for coming back and clicking on my video. Today, we are doing part two to my breast augmentation update video. I apologize, guys. I actually had no intention of making this a two-part series. I was almost at the end of completely editing the original video, the one that I obviously have already posted by this point, the part one to the update. Um, and I realized that a whole chunk, like good 15, 20 minutes of the video just completely disappeared. I couldn't find it. It wasn't on my camera because I had kind of already deleted it off of my SD card at this point, And it wasn't on my external hard drive and it wasn't in my actual laptop. So I, I don't know what happened. I don't know if I just didn't click go when I was filming that portion of it. I have no idea what happened to it. So here we are, part two to my breast augmentation update video. I'm not really gonna go over much of what I went over in part one because that just wouldn't make sense. I'm just gonna go into more of my experience with getting it done, what I regret doing, what I would change my recommendations for you guys, so on and so forth. Now, just to do the quick little YouTuber thing, please do me a favor and just scroll past the screen, smash the thumbs up button. That means click on the thumbs up button. As a small content creator, it does really truly help me out to push my videos out there into the YouTube first. Also, if you find yourself coming back to my channel quite frequently, or if you just want to join the fam, please do me a favor and click the subscribe button as well as the push notification bell right next to it. You cannot subscribe without pushing the push notification or technically you can. You just won't be notified of when I post a video. And without further ado, guys, we're gonna roll into it. Here we are, a couple of weeks later. It's actually been two weeks since I filmed the original video. I tried, guys, okay, I tried. We're here, this is a very technologically unadvanced channel here that we're working with. So that something happened, I don't know what happened. By the time that I am filming this video right now, I haven't actually posted my original update video for you guys, so I don't know how well it's going. I don't know what questions you guys have. I will still make a part three to this if you guys did put questions in either one of these videos, just like the original one that I said. Um, if you have questions at the end of this video that I haven't actually touched based on things that you would like to know, please either DM me over on Instagram, I am very active over on Instagram, or leave comments in the comment box below with questions that you would like me to answer and I will obviously make a part three to this. So um, part one, I went over a lot more about the facts involved with getting a breast augmentation, why I got it done, what type of implants I got done, things to know regarding BII, capsular contracture, why I chose a surgeon that I did, all of that. This is more so my personal experience with it. Updates and things that I wish that I had known prior to getting my breast augmentation, things of recommendations that I have for you guys. So to kind of touch base a little bit, again, just to go back and re refresh you guys, just because if it's been a little bit and you didn't see that video or you haven't actually clicked that video, I will link it up here for you guys. I highly recommend that you watch that video first and possibly even the vlog that I had regarding my first week of getting a breast augmentation. I, I recommend that you guys watch those videos before you watch this one, but just in case that you really don't want to. Um, hi guys, I had a breast augmentation <laughs> back in May of 2020. Currently, as we're sitting filming this video, it is the last day of February, 2021. It is the 29th, 28th. This year is 28 days in February. February 28th, 2021. So it's been about nine to 10 months since I've had my breast augmentation. When did I have it done? Like I said, in May, 2020, I had a breast augmentation done. I have silicone 400 cc's smooth round high profile implants. I got them done in Houston, Texas, where I live. And no, I do not regret getting my breast augmentation. I absolutely love having my breasts, my boobs. I love them. I have zero regrets with getting getting them done, but there are quite a few things that I wish I had known prior to getting them done. Things that I now, because I work in the industry and also because I've had them for nine, 10 months, things that I will know going into getting a revision surgery. I am not in any way going to be getting a revision surgery anytime soon, but for when that time comes, I will obviously keep these things in mind when I go through it again, because I will be getting my rest done, hopefully again, unless things happen, obviously. Because in case you guys do not know, I think I mentioned this in my original video, breast implants do not last a lifetime, <laughs> okay? You do need to know this before you go in to get the surgery done. They are not a lifetime product. It is recommended that you do get your breasts redone about every 10 to 15 years because they are not a lifelong product. Um, things can happen, your body can harden, you can develop capsular contracture grade level three or four later on the longer that you do have them because your body's, it's your defense mechanism against them and it still doesn't for an object that you are putting in your body and your body's not going to like having it there for a very long time you do have to get them revised over time. It doesn't mean that you have to go through a really crazy reconstructive surgery, but what we do, at least where I work in the um, plastic surgery office that I do work at, we call it an implant exchange. Some people call it a breast revision. 
I guess technically it's kind of a revision, but typically it's just a simple exchange. Whether you're exchanging for larger, exchanging for the same size, exchanging to go smaller, x plenty them, whatever the case is. 10 to 15 years is around that time that you really want to consider getting that done. And 15 years is kind of on the longer side of things. Realistically, you guys should be going in and getting your breast checked out around the ten, nine to 10 year mark to see how things are going. And plus guys, like 10 years, your body changes a lot in a 10 year period. You know, I see women who are coming in around my age who've had their implants done for 10 years and they got them originally done when they're 18 and now they're like 28, 29 and they're like, oh, I've had them for 10 years. I just want to get them changed. Like think about how your body changes between 18 to 29. It's a lot. Same thing as if you're going through like my age, I'm 30. I just had them done in 10 years from now, I'll be 40. And hopefully by then I'll have already have like birthed a child and your body changes a lot throughout that time frame. So you're going to want to get them looked at because your skin might have started to sag over time. You might need a lift by this point. Uh, maybe you don't need a lift. Maybe you just need a little bit more upper pole fullness. So you guys already know obviously what sizes I had. Oh, so I get this question a lot because in case, I don't think I mentioned this in my update video, but I did in my original video. The location that I went to to get my augmentation done obviously was not the surgeon that I do currently work at. I get this question a lot is, Megan, why did you not get your implants done by the surgeon that you currently work at? Um, and this is kind of a two-part thing. First of all, I did a kind of, I, I semi mentioned this. I had my implants done prior to me working at the office that I do currently work at. And the reason I didn't get it done where I currently work at is just honestly, truly transparency, price point, <laughs> fully price point. I work at a clinic that is worldwide known for what we do. We are one of the absolute best offices that you can go to in the entire world. The Caravino method is literally known worldwide. We have people that fly in from like London, from Germany. London's not a country, but it's a city, you know, London, Germany, Switzerland. We have people fly in from all over the world to get their breasts done by us because Dr. Rohan's known all over the world, Dr. Caravino prior to her, and she is known worldwide for what she does, especially in Texas. She is hands down the best in Texas for what she does, if not even the entire country for what she does. But she is known, Caravino is known worldwide for what they do. So obviously because of that and because of the demographic of where we are located, we're located in River Oaks in Houston, Texas, our price point is much higher and we charge what we believe believe we're, we're worth. Um, and we are worth that much. We have a lot of women on a monthly basis coming to get their breasts on by us because we are well so well known and we price point up to what we know. We are able to charge obviously to cover the fact we're the best at what we do. So the reason I didn't go to my office to get my breast augmentation done is one, because I got it done before I started working there. Um, and two, it was at the tail end of quarantine. I didn't have $7,7500 to spend on getting a breast augmentation. I spent, like I said, I think it was a little over $5,000 to get my breasts done. And this person who I went to was running a promotion. So that being said, I then get the question of, do I regret going where I went? And no, I, I don't regret it. Obviously knowing what I know now, would I have waited until I started working at Caravino to get my breast done? Yes, of course so. Of course I would have waited because one, it would have been far less money <laughs> getting it done. And I just waited because I would have obviously gotten them like an employee discount or something. Two, I, it's, I would have been going to the absolute best of the absolute best for getting my breasts done. Three, I, I feel a lot more comfortable, obviously, in the office that I'm that I'm working in because I know everybody, I know their background, uh, and I just, I feel protected there. Not that I didn't feel protected where I went, but that's kind of just it. Overall, it's just because of price point, guys. I was cheap, I wanted to get it done, and I got it done. <laughs> that being said, though, um, whenever I do decide to get, obviously, my breasts redone, whether it's to go larger, to go smaller, whatever the point is, um, if, whenever I do decide to get them redone, I will obviously go to where I work to get them redone. There you go. I get asked a lot of questions over, am I happy with my size or any recommendations on choosing a size, cup size, type of profiles, all of that. And again, I, I'm going to reference my previous video a lot because I mentioned it a lot there, but guys, sizing is completely dependent upon your body, your surgeon, all of that. The first time that you get your breast augmentation done, you really need to listen to the surgeon that you go to, to go for sizing because they're, your body can only hold hold a certain, a certain size of implant. And I guess to kind of reel it back in, I mentioned the fact that I, I think I was around like an 11 and a half to 12.5. I forget what my sizing was, to be honest. It's been a while. I didn't take note of it. But the sizes that I was provided when I went in to get my breast augmentation was a 325 to 425. That's what could safely be fit into my body. I obviously chose to go with a 400. Um, and to be very honest, when I went into my consultation, I went with my now fiance, Nick, and we were meeting with one of the consultants there. I think she's also the office manager. She was fantastic, Mary. She was awesome. I still remember her name to this day because that's how good she was. Had all always said from the beginning that I wanted to have a round shape effect. So like I kind of currently do, I'm wearing a different sports bra than I was wearing last time, guys. I wanted it to look round like this, but I didn't want it to look crazy. I wanted it to still look natural. And I, 
<laughs> I think that I mean, it's kind of similar to what everybody says when they go into an, into their consultation. They're like, I want to look natural. I don't want people to judge me. I want people to know I had it done, but I don't want them to like know I had it done. You know what I mean? Um, and I was the exact same way. So when I was told sizes of 325 to 425, I freaked. I was like, because every other consultation before that, I was told that I was around like the 275 to 325 range. So for me, starting at 325, I was like, oh, good. I can go a little bit bigger than I normally wanted to. Like I, to me, it's like, okay, I can get a little bit more. Like that's, that's awesome. But at the same time, it scared me because 325, you have to keep in mind guys, when you get implants, you're adding that implant to the breast tissue that you naturally currently have. I was scared. I didn't really have too much breast tissue to begin with. Like I think I was a B, a very, very, very small B before I had my implants in, but 325 is a pretty good size implant to be really honest, guys. Like it's, that's a pretty hefty implant. Um, but I, you know, hearing 425, I'm like, okay, I, all the information that I was given from my friends who have had implants before that have always told me, don't go with a lower sizing. If you can go bigger, go bigger because you are going to regret it. But because there was a 100cc difference between my lowest end and my highest end, 425 really freaked me out because that was a massive implant in my eyes when I obviously look back on it. Not having any implants, like that was huge. To me, that implant looked like it was the size of my head. It wasn't, but to me it was, it really freaked me out. So I, in my mind, knew that I didn't want to do 325, but I also didn't want to do 425. 350 to me looked a little bit too small, but 375 was kind of like that sweet spot, 375 to 400. And after talking to Nick, after talking to the consultant, I decided to go with 400 because 425, I really, it just freaked me out way too much. And 375, I really wanted the 375, honestly. That's truly in my gut what I wanted. I wanted 375 because it looked really good when I, there was a surgical bra that they put on my body and she put the 375 in my body to kind of give me a visual of what it was going to look like. And I was like, you know, I really like the look of the 375. The 375 is giving me the fullness, the upper pole fullness that I like, but something that she had told me, which is actually, I'm glad that she told me because it's what I tell my patients nowadays is you lose about five to 10% of the volume of the implant when you go submuscular. There are two different areas that you can go submuscular or subglandular, meaning you can go under the muscle or over the muscle because I do work out quite consistently and because I am very thin, um, meaning I have thin skin here. It was better for me to go submuscular. That way I didn't get rippling up here and you were, it didn't look like I would have like two big balls on my chest. So because I was going under the muscle, I was losing about five to 10% of that volume. So what she said was, if you like the look of the 375, go with the 400, because even though it's a little bit more than that five to 10%, it's still gonna give you the look that you want. So to be honest, guys, I went with 400 and I was very hesitant with the 400. I remember even going into my pre-op appointment and even the day of surgery, I was like, is 400 too big? Like I was freaking the, f the fuck out, to be honest. I don't know if I can say the F word on YouTube, but I was freaking the fuck out the day on surgery because I was like, 400 sounds out of this world big. Like there are women who are just bigger women than me, not just like, there's bigger women than me. They're a lot taller than me, a lot broader than me who were only doing like 500s, 550s. And here I was, this tiny little petite 110 pound girl, five foot four, getting... 400 cc implants. So I was freaking out, honestly. And you guys can see during my vlog as well, I regretted getting 400 cc's for the first couple of weeks because I was not fully into that sizing. I feel like my recovery the first couple of weeks would have gone a lot smoother if I, because I am also a control freak guys. If I can't personally make that decision, and I did, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not blaming Nick. I'm not blaming the consultant whatsoever. Um, I went with their recommendation because they, they Nick knows me very well and he knows that I'll regret things. I always regret things. If I'm between a couple of things and I never, and I go with things that I shouldn't really go with, he's like, you're gonna regret it. You're gonna regret it. So I, I went with the 400 because I knew I was going to regret it. But in my mind, I was like, I really want the 375. I really want the 375. So all throughout recovery, my recovery was so hard. And the entire time when I was recovering and I was like, oh, they're sitting so high. They're only sitting really high because I went with a really big size. You know, they look crazy and pointy and I look I look like a linebacker and it's because I went with 400. So I've sort of gone 375s. And realistically, guys, <laughs> knowing what I know now and looking back on recovery, you need to know that it's not due to the fact that you went up up 25 cc's 25 cc's is so minimal so to kind of go back to the original question no i don't regret going with the size that i went with i really like how they look and i'm going to kind of stand up for you guys obviously i'm wearing high, high waisted pants i really like how how they are they are a little bit obviously bigger than what I thought that they were gonna be, but I love them. I love the effect that they give. I think that they fit really well. Plus I'm on a journey to gain a little bit of weight in my booty. So I think that everything's gonna kind of play together really well. And I don't regret getting my sizing. And honestly, 
you know, I will say this, my surgeon taught me this, Dr. Mohan, she taught me this a lot, is that there is such thing as boob greed and people get it all the time. And I am, I am to show for that. I honestly kind of wish I went with 425, but I'm not obviously planning on getting them redone anytime soon. So, and then I get the question of when you do get them redone, will you go bigger? Um, what things will you do differently next time? So yes, obviously at some point in the future, not anytime soon, I will get them redone. I think we'll probably wait to get them redone until after I have kids, just because your body changes a lot after having kids. Kid, one kid, we are not doing more than one child ain't happening. My body's obviously gonna change a lot because your breasts grow, breastfeeding hopefully. You're gonna gain weight throughout pregnancy, all of that. And then a lot of women, after you have kids, obviously your skin starts to sag down over time because you're gaining a lot of weight in that area and then you're losing it pretty rapidly. So um, I will hopefully wait until after that happens for me to have my revision surgery or to have my implant exchange. At that point, things that I will do differently. One, and I didn't know this was an option obviously because it wasn't provided to me, rightfully so when I was going through my consultation, but I will go with a different profile implants the next time I get it done. I either want to do extra filled implants or ultra high implants, or I might just go with a different brand. I might go with Allergan as opposed to Mentor. Um, I love Mentor, but they do feel very natural. And I'm learning the more that I have my implants that I kind of, I want them to, like, if I'm gonna have fake implants, I kind of want them to look more fake than they currently look. Like, obviously you look at me, you know that I have fake boobs. Like, you know that I have had a breast augmentation. But when I talk about fake look, I want them to sit higher i want them to have be rounder i want and i want them to stay like this yeah, hello friends i'm sorry to jump in here really fast i'm in at the tail end of doing like final touches on this video and i just want to explain this a little bit better for you guys so for any first time patient who's never had a breast augmentation or it's just first, your first time going through it. Um, the reason I was not provided with getting an extra field or an ultra high profile implant was rightly so 95 to even 99 percent of the time no first time breast augmentation patient should really be provided with doing an ultra high, high profile implant unless you have very um, loose skin very saggy skin if you're doing like an augmasto meaning you need to lift with it because you just have very um, loose skin up here you should not be getting an extra filled and ultra high implant because it can actually do more harm than good. Your body needs to get used to having the implants first before you go either larger or you go up in profile. So for somebody like me, first time breast dog patient who has never had kids before, I don't need a lift um, and my skin's actually pretty good quality, I was not presented that option because I my body couldn't safely fit those profiles into my body. So that being said, when I go back, to get them redone whenever that time comes, I would like to get a bigger profile because my body's already used to having the implants. Makes sense. Awesome. Thanks for my TED talk. This is something that I didn't know when I originally had my breast augmentation. I didn't know that your breasts drop as much as they do. I assumed that when you had implants in that they were just gonna sit perky and high and tight for your entire life, but that's not the case. Unless you're getting a lift, your implants can't lift your breast. So if you go to your surgeon and you're told that you need to have an augmentation mastopexy or breast implants with a lift, um, or you need a lift as a whole, you need to understand that if you decide that you don't get the lift and you only are gonna get the implants, implants do not lift, they only fill. So if your breasts naturally sit lower on your body, they're just going to naturally sit lower on your body, but they're going to look bigger, obviously, because you're filling the area that you have, they're not lifted up. By no means did I, prior to surgery, need to get a lift. I didn't need a lift, I still don't need a lift. Um, but something that I've learned, obviously working in the industry that I, I work in, I am naturally lower breasted than some women are, meaning that I have more chest space here. So a lot of women, their breasts probably naturally sit right up here but just the way that my anatomy works, my breasts naturally sit down here. So even when I put a lower cut shirt on, because my breasts naturally sit lower, you can't really see a lot of cleavage. And that's just what I thought I was gonna get out of it. I thought that I was gonna have like this. I thought they were gonna naturally sit like this and all, of my, all I'm doing right now is pushing them up like this. And yes, you can move your implants. I, can, I can't really, I'll touch base on this in a little bit. I can't really feel them, but I can move them up into my body like that to be, to sit higher. I wanted a look like like this. I wanted them to naturally sit perky and high like that. So when I wore something like this, um, or I wore a lower cut shirt, they would naturally look like that. But I'm still finding myself that I need to wear a push-up bra in order to get that effect that I want. Some women really luck out. A lot of women aren't naturally low breasted. They have higher naturally sitting breasts. So they 
can get away without ever having to wear a push-up bra. I'm just not one of those women. So something I'm hoping to do, obviously the next time that whenever that happens, I get my breasts redone, is I want to get an extra filled implant, which again, it's a different profile or ultra high. Ultra high implants are a little bit more of a higher profile implant than, meant, than the high profile implant. So it gives you a little bit more fullness here or extra filled is just a really filled silicone implant. Obviously the higher profile that you get, obviously the, the shorter it is here. And I'm okay, honestly, with losing a little bit of side boob. I have a little bit more side boob than I personally would like. So I think that I will probably go down a size if I get ultra high profile or extra filled and I'll just go up in profile because I, I like the size of my breasts. I don't wanna go bigger, but I do want them to be a little bit more rounded up here. Now, obviously by that point, I might need a lift as well. I hope that I don't because that's a very invasive procedure, but I didn't know that they were going to drop as much. I didn't know that high profile implants were going to sit naturally in the body like a teardrop. I had no idea about that. And I'll be really honest because I am so thin when I don't have a bra on and I am looking at myself, I do still kind of look like I just have two balls sitting on my chest, but that's just, that's my body. I'm thin. I don't really have much fat to cover it up. But as you guys can see, and I showed you this in my last video, when I turn to the side, they do sit like a slope in the body as opposed to me when I push it up like that there's a clear delineation between my chest and where the implant is which that's the look that I want <laughs> which I I don't have but that's okay I'll just I'll wait until obviously that time comes and I get them redone so no again going back I do not regret my breast augmentation I just wish that I would have known that prior to getting it done because I I'm not given the look that I really want without having to wear a bra. And that brings me to another thing, guys. One big thing that you absolutely need to know about having a breast augmentation is that you need to take care of your breast afterwards. I went into having a breast augmentation thinking that I never would have to wear a bra again, that they would naturally sit high and perky and tight for the rest of my life because that's like the point of getting a breast augmentation, right? That they're supposed to look cute and high and tight and young for the rest of your life. That's not the case. If anything, having implants is a lot more high maintenance than not having them because when I has had no titties, I was part of the itty bitty titty committee, I never wore a bra. I would wear a bra to like work and when I went out, but as soon as I got home, the first thing I would do is take my bra off and just walk around willy nilly free, free ball, free boobing it because that's just what I like to do. I don't like the feeling of having a bra on. Having implants now, guys, in order to prevent needing a lift later on in life, you need to wear a bra at all times, day and night, literally sleeping except when you're showering, obviously, anytime you go out, when you work out, it's so important to wear a bra because if you're thinking about it, adding for me 400 cc's is probably about adding like, I don't know, a quarter pound, half a pound. I don't, I didn't actually weigh my implants. I have no idea, but you're adding extra weight to your skin. And even though I have pretty tight skin, like I'm, I'm pretty healthy over time. If you do not wear a bra, what's going to happen? Gravity will take effect and your skin will start to pull down over time. Meaning that even if your nipple placement doesn't really change, they're going to be sitting a lot lower on your body than they did when you didn't have implants in because you're adding weight to your skin. Naturally it's going to happen. They're going to drop further. So do yourself a favor and wear a bra. If you are somebody who doesn't now like to wear a bra and you never want to wear a bra again, you might really wanna reconsider getting a breast augmentation because you're still adding weight to your body, okay? That's not to say that you can never go bra free. I still, most of the time, don't really wear a bra when I get home from work um, for like an hour or two, but I do obviously put it on for when I go to bed and then when I go to work and work out. I. I definitely wear a bra now because I, I I don't want to need a lift later on in life. In case if you guys do have questions about an augmasto, augmentation mastopexy, or a, a breast lift, leave those questions down below. I've never had one done, but I can obviously give you guys information about it. I'm not against ever having a lift. If I ever need to get one done, I certainly will, but it's just, it's a longer recovery. There's a lot more scars involved. It's a lot more invasive. So I personally want to prevent having to have that as long as possible. Something else that I did not know prior to having my breast augmentation Augmentation. I work out guys, you guys know this. I, I've been part of the health and fitness industry for over 15 years. I've been working out for over 15 years. And I did not know when I was having my breast augmentation that you can't do chest workouts ever again. Like I, I, I didn't know. I did ask my consultant, I was like, well, am I able to do chest workouts? I vaguely remember her saying, oh, well, no, you don't need to do those ever again. And it was more so like saying, oh, you don't need to do those again. It wasn't so much like, no, you can't do those ever again. Um, I don't remember her saying that, but I, I don't blame her. Like if you're not a part of the health and fitness community and you don't work out very rigorously as much as I do, it might not be something that you think about needing to bring up. But for me, if anybody out there who loves health and fitness, you really shouldn't be doing direct chest workouts ever again after having implants, especially if they are submuscular because 
you gotta think about it guys when you do chest presses you do push-ups when you do dumbbell flies you're working your chest and if you have your implants underneath of your chest muscle and you're working that muscle over time when you're working that muscle even if you're not a build bodybuilder and you're just trying to like tighten that area up your muscle contracts and moves contracts and moves and over time your muscles sit like this they're going to start to move out like that right when that happens your implants also start to move and they're not going to sit in the spot that you want them to when you do those workouts so i you know, when I was clear to start working out, I was doing a four day workout split to where I was still doing, I don't like lift really heavy guys, but I was doing like 20 pound dumbbells for chest press. I was doing um, cable flies. I was doing a lot of direct chest workouts for the first three to four months after having my breast augmentation. Those are the most crucial months for recovery. And I didn't know I shouldn't have been doing them. So when I started working where I work now, I was like, you know, I was just talking to my surgeon one day and I was like, you know, I have a question like why why do my breasts sit so far apart compared to somebody else? And she directly, she looked at me in the eyes and she was like, it's because you do fitness and because you do chest workouts. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, you gotta stop doing that kind of stuff. You can work that muscle that muscle area without having to do trust, um, direct chest workouts. So I do like a lot of planks now. I do kind of still do push-ups. I don't do like a ton of them. I'll get on my knees and I'll do like girly push-ups or I'll do like shoulder presses to kind of hit this area. But I kind of had to learn to work around it. But for those of you guys who are like bodybuilders, your fitness competitors if you see women whose implants sit very far apart like that and they look scary it's because they've been working out that muscle group for a very long time and they are submuscular so normally i can at least tell you in our clinic when our surgeon does her consultations and somebody tells her that she, they are a fitness competitor she will either say you shouldn't do chest workouts anymore or we have to move your implants um, to do being subglandular, not submuscular, because um, that way they'll still kind of semi sit where they're supposed to be sitting. But yeah, I just, I kind of wish that I had known that beforehand. Not that it would have prevented me from getting it done because I'm not really that big on doing chest workouts anyway. I just wouldn't have done those workouts during my recovery period. Like the three, you know, once I was clear to work out, I wouldn't have done chest workouts ever afterward. I would have steered clear of them, which I think just would have made my overall results look a little bit better than they currently do. They look great, but they could look excellent. You know what I mean? Had I known that, I wouldn't have done it. That's something else I wish I would have known. Sorry guys, <laughs> I do this in like every one of my videos, so you should just be used to it by this point. My camera died because I filmed an entire video before this, which was very long, and then it just died. It died. So I think we are talking about fitness. Let's see, other things what do they look like after surgery so if you guys are coming from my vlog you guys will know i didn't really show you my breasts for the first week i was so beyond embarrassed i was literally so beyond embarrassed i was so ashamed of how i looked because even though i knew going into my surgery that the recovery was going to be hard and that my implants were going to sit really high they were going to look square and i watched so many youtube videos prior to my surgery to prep myself for what the recovery would be like even though i knew all of these things going into it it's a lot easier seeing somebody else go through it and knowing something than it is actually experiencing it and i hated my recovery i knew about the swelling i knew about the bloating i knew that they were going to look square and tight and high but I was put under general anesthesia, which depending upon the doctor that you go to, I mean, in the office that I work at, it's still a type of general anesthesia, but it's IV sedation. And the, the lifespan of IV sedation in your body, it has like, I think it's half the lifespan than general anesthesia does, meaning that it leaves your system a lot quicker. So the recovery time's a lot easier. The recovery system is, just the recovery as a whole is a lot easier for patients than it is to go under regular general anesthesia with it like being intubated, the whole thing. But because of the surgeon, I don't know if they typically use it at the surgeon I went to, but it could have also also just been due to COVID. Because of COVID, I think a lot of places were really locked down with what they could do. So I went under regular general anesthesia and I had to get intubated. I did have some complications with that. I was severely bloated, like insanely bloated. And that bloating peaked around like day three, four, and five. I was so uncomfortable. I couldn't go to the bathroom. I, I could pee obviously, but I couldn't do number two for quite a few days. I was taking like Miralax and all those other um, laxatives to try to get something out. And I didn't, I didn't poop honestly for about three to four days because of it. I was drinking
drinking so much water just to try to push the bloating out because again, fitness background, nutrition background, I was thinking, okay, um, if you're bloated, maybe you just had too much sodium. And even though I knew it was due to anesthesia, I was like, okay, when I'm bloated because of sodium, I just drink a lot of water and it kind of helps push it out. But even drinking a ton of water wasn't helping the fact that I was bloated. So I was really uncomfortable because of that. I was really cranky. I could not sleep, which I'll touch base on in a second, but my recovery was so hard and it's I've never been through surgeries before and I saw all these proceed all these youtubers who had an easy recovery and I just wanted to be transparent with you guys when I had my vlog day by day what I was going through because my recovery sucked and it wasn't painful it just it was hard I only had I didn't really have somebody to help me out throughout the procedure because unfortunately just due to where we were in quarantine the day of surgery Nick was with me obviously and he was with me that entire day but honestly I felt pretty good the day of surgery like I still had anesthesia in my body I was taking my medication um, and I don't really remember much because I went into my surgery very early in the morning. I went at like, I think it was like seven or 7.30 in the morning. I think it was like the first case of the day. Um, and then I kind of remember waking up after surgery. Like I remember the nurse waking me up and I remember getting to the car. I don't really remember the car ride home. And I remember getting back home and I tried to take a nap, but I couldn't fall asleep for whatever reason. Um, and then I remember getting really violently ill because of the anesthesia, because that is a symptom from general anesthesia is you can get very sick. I didn't actually throw up, but I remember like, I was standing up and I was like, I need to force myself to eat something because I'm somebody who's used to eating breakfast every single day. Like the first thing I do when I wake up is eat breakfast. I can never fast in the morning. Like it's, I must be very ill to not eat in the morning. Um, and I couldn't do that. By the time I had gotten home from surgery, it had to be like, 11 30 12 and i had to sleep for a little bit so i probably didn't have i didn't have food in my system for a good 15 16 hours so i i remember standing up from bed after trying to take a nap for a couple of hours going into the kitchen to try to get some food um, and i had walked halfway from our bedroom to our kitchen i was standing in my living room and i just got a cold rush of sweat and chills and just i literally just felt my i was like an outer body experience i was like i'm gonna throw up and i remember running to the sink in my kitchen and just gagging my life away which just was fantastic on top of the fact that i have two boulder sitting on my chest, right? So like, it's little things like that, that you, you know that these things can happen, but when you're going through it, you're like, wow, this fucking sucks. <laughs> it doesn't feel good to just get out of surgery, have more heavy weight on your chest. And now you're vomiting profusely in the sink. It's just, you have to prep yourself to know that you might not be one of those lucky people that recovery is the easiest because mine was not. And again, I don't want to go through all of the symptoms because you guys can see my vlog for that. The day of, like I said, to kind of go back to it, I had Nick there the day of my surgery because he actually took time off of work. Unfortunately, the job that he's working, he didn't get time off for um, his job. He's a GM at a, at a health and fitness club. And even though gyms weren't open then as the GM, his terrible company that he works at actually made him go into work every single day to walk the building to make sure nobody broke in. It's horrific, whatever. You know what? God bless so that he still had a job. So I will say that. But they made him, I guess gyms opened up it was like three days after my surgery. And by the time I had my surgery, like they didn't know if they were gonna open up. And of course the day of my surgery, my freaking luck, that his company had reached out and said, hey, we're opening up gyms. Um, in a couple of days. So he had to go back to work the day after my surgery. So I was left on my own to do my own thing and to kind of figure things out my own. I didn't prepare myself well enough to really be on my own. Um, and what I mean by this is my house isn't really set up for somebody who's just gone through surgery. I have really heavy, like my all my utensils, all my, my plates, my silverware, my cups are all up in really high shelves. Even though I did rapid recovery where if with rapid recovery, you have to like lift up your arms a couple of times every few hours um, and they want you to move and they want you to like get get your arms moving to reduce inflammation and to just keep blood flowing and everything even though i was allowed to physically lift up and grab anything you're still under the restrictions of not lifting anything more than 20 pounds and the day after surgery mentally i was okay i felt fine but my body didn't. <laughs> I was in so much pain in the days after surgery because I couldn't sleep. You have to sleep on your back for, it's like two to four weeks after surgery. You cannot sleep on your side. You cannot sleep on your stomach. You have to sleep on your back. You don't have to sleep on like sitting up. That's such a big misconception um, with breast augmentation so that you have to sleep in a chair or you have to sleep in like a recliner. Or you have to sleep at a certain degree. No, that's not the case whatsoever. It's just more so if you sleep with one pillow, prop it up to two so your body 
is at a higher incline just to prevent yourself from turning over. And I am not somebody who naturally sleeps on my back. I am a face in the pillow, head down, snoring in my pillow type of person, like laying on my tummy at all times. So having to sleep on my back was a big adjustment. I couldn't fall asleep because I couldn't sleep how I normally do. Plus the fact that my muscles kept spasming out. I just wish I would have known or I wish I would have prepared myself mentally for the recovery more so than I actually did. Prescriptions, what prescriptions do I put on? What prescriptions do places recommend for you? This is all gonna be different and it's gonna vary depending upon the surgeon that you do go to. Some places do give you narcotics. Where I work, we actually don't give out narcotics because realistically for a simple breast augmentation, you really shouldn't need a narcotic to get through it. It's not that. Uh, much of a painful procedure, at least the way that we do it at our practice. But the place that I went to, I was issued out, I believe it was a narcotic, I think it was Norco, I think. But I was given five different prescriptions. I was given an antibiotic, which I had to start taking the night before surgery. And that varies by location as well. Some surgeons say wait until after surgery, but I had to take one the night before. I was given a pain medication, a muscle relaxer, an anti-nausea pain medication and that was it. So I was given four medications, I believe. In case you guys don't know, I, at the time was not working. Obviously I was still in quarantine and I had accepted a job at that point for once quarantine had ended, but I didn't have medical insurance. So I know this, this wasn't a specific question that I was asked, but no, you do not have to have insurance in order to get this procedure done. The procedure itself isn't covered under insurance whatsoever. I don't think any cosmetic procedure actually is, um, regardless of where you go to, unless it's medically deemed necessary that you need to have it done. But I'm more so talking about like the prescriptions. I used good RX because it was completely complimentary. So my prescriptions were much lower than what they even, I think I, I spent less money with good RX than I even did with my previous insurance with Lifetime when I was working there. I think I spent like $20 out of pocket with GoodRx. Now with GoodRx, again, I'm not an expert on this, you have to go to their site and you plug in what prescriptions you need and it tells you what locations have the cheapest ones. Normally it's going to be places like Walmart, Kroger, H-E-B, like grocery stores are going to be the most affordable, not so much CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid, because those type of drugs, drug stores typically give out like name brand prescriptions, whereas Kroger, Walmart, they give out um, generic brands, which gen generic brands are totally fine. But mine were pretty affordable. I think I spent like $20 to $25 on the prescriptions and then I also had to get hit cleanse, which is the antibacterial soap that you use the night before in the morning of surgery. I got that at um, Kroger as well. So in total, I spent like 30 to $35 on my prescriptions and my HIPAA cleanse. I will say um, I wasn't specifically told how to use my prescriptions or how to take them prior to my surgery. And I do wish that I was because it's so confusing when you get home and you're like all over the place with, with anesthesia in your body. And when I had, I didn't, I think I had a sheet that told me when to take my medications or what they were but because I had gotten generic brands of these medications, the names didn't match up and I had to kind of figure it out. So for the most part, Nick the first day told me what to take and what not to take, but I was never told what order to take them in or when to take them. So the one thing that at my practice that we tell patients is, um, you know, generic brands totally fine, but make sure the biggest thing to make sure is to is to ensure that your pain medication is not substituted out for anything that is ibuprofen, aspirin, Advil, or Aleve related because all of those are blood thinners. The only thing that you really should be substituted out with, whether it's a narcotic or just a regular pain medication. <laughs> if it needs to be substituted out with something, make sure that it's just Tylenol related because Tylenol is the only pain medication that is not a blood thinner. My Kroger did not give me that. My Kroger gave me ibuprofen. And um, actually, no, I think I had. I must have had five medications because I definitely had a Norco. I had Norco and I had muscle relax and they also gave me ibuprofen, like a bunch of ibuprofen. So for some reason I was given ibuprofen, but I was given like this narcotic pill to take and I only took it one time when I was really in pain after the first night and it made me feel really sick so I stopped taking it. I didn't know not to take ibuprofen. I didn't know it was a blood thinner so I my bruises were pretty big. I'll touch base in a little bit about why you want to steer away from bruising <laughs> or why that could be a concern, but I didn't know not to take an ibuprofen. I was never told any of that, so I wish that I was. Again, nothing really happened. I don't really have any complications with anything, but there are potential complications that can occur when you take a blood thinner. I wish I was told the one thing that we tell all of our patients, which is try taking your muscle relaxer before you take your pain medication, because for most of us, if you go submuscular with your implants, your muscles are going to really cause a lot of the pain that you're experiencing. So if you take your muscle relaxer before your pain, a lot of the pain that 
that you have, or it's gonna be subsided before you need to take your pain medication. Sometimes though, there are patients who are still experiencing discomfort after taking the pain med the muscle relaxer. So it's okay, go ahead and take your pain medication. But I just like to give that tip out to everybody because if you don't have to take pain medications, it's going to make your recovery a lot easier because the less pain medications you're taking in, the easier it will be for your body to relieve itself, meaning you won't have bloating for longer, meaning that you are not going to be as uncomfortable in the restroom for longer. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. I just spoke about bleeding, um, bruising, blood thinners, how, why it's a big deal. And that's because it can actually cause a hematoma. And if you guys don't know what a hematoma is, it means that there's blood and it's in that area and bruising, essentially you have bruising. So I did have bruising. I had pretty heavy bruising right here. And I, I knew that there was gonna be a little bit of bruising, but I didn't know how much bruising I was actually going to have. And I kind of lucked out because I don't have a capsular contracture, but the biggest thing that can actually happen when you have a hematoma is you can develop a capsular contracture later on. Um, and it's more likely for you to develop a capsular contracture because when your skin, because when that scar tissue is forming and you have a blood supply that's there and, and it gets to that area, it can, and I'm not a scientist, I don't know the specific reasons behind it so don't come for me but from what I understand it can actually harden your capsule quicker over time so as of right now 10 months post-op I don't have a capsular contracture I know that I'm at a higher likelihood of developing one on this side because I did have some bleeding but I feel like a lot of that bleeding would have or that bruising would have not been there had I not been given a blood thinner and again I'm not blaming the surgeon that I went to for the blood thinner um, I just wish I was told to tell Kroger not to give me a blood thinner because they might have given me you know they might have just said hey we don't have anything else and I would have just picked up Tylenol so I mean I again might luck out <laughs> it's 10 months and I still don't have a capsule but I am, um, I think, at a higher likelihood of having that because my bruising was so bad. A little bit of bruising is completely normal. What we tell patients in my office is if you have br bruising that's about the size of the palm of your hand or bigger, you need to call us and we'll have you come back in because we might have to flush that area out to make sure it's clean so you don't develop a capsular contracture later on in life. <laughs> Do they feel real? <laughs> Uh, now, yes, yeah, they, they do, they feel real. I mean, as I sit here, just touching my boobs. Yeah, they feel real, they feel just as real as my regular breasts felt. Honestly, uh, the first couple of weeks, no, even the first month or two, about a month and a half, they didn't feel real, they were like rock solid and super hard. I would say around like the two and a half to three month mark, yeah, they, they started feeling real and natural and they feel completely fine to me. I mean, they feel like breasts to me. I could just be used to them, but they feel totally real to me. Another question, nipple sensation. Did I lose my nipple sensation? Um, was it the complete opposite or effect or reverse effect where they actually became really more, like a lot more sensitive? You're gonna lose sensation, guys. You're gonna lose sensation over a lot of parts in your breast for the first couple of months because you're still cutting that area, right? Again, there's still trauma in that area. I did not go around my areola or through my areola for my implants. Like I didn't go through my nipple because I wanted it to have a higher likelihood of me being able to breast feed and if you cut around the areola you're cutting through a lot of the milk ducts so you're at a higher risk of not being able to breastfeed if you decide to have children obviously um, than you would be if you didn't go through the areola i went under i went um through the imf fold the infirmary fold right here un or under the must under the boob essentially one to be able to hide the scars and two because i wanted again a higher likelihood of being able to breastfeed later on in life even though i didn't go through here and i went under the boob you're still cutting through nerves so I remember for the first couple of weeks, I didn't have any feeling around my breasts right here. Anytime I would touch it, it felt like it was just numb. Like I could, I could feel there was pressure, but I couldn't actually feel anything. And I don't know if you guys have ever had like a dental block when you go to the dentist to get dental work done and you're like, you're touching things and you're like, I can feel that I'm touching it, but I can't feel anything. That's how it felt in my breast. My nipples though, I, there was weird times, like one day they would be super overly sensitive to the point where I couldn't even like put a t-shirt on because I felt like, it literally felt like daggers <laughs> in my nipples. But then the next day I would have lost all sensation. And this went on and off for the first month and a half to two months, even up to three months, I would still get like overly sensitive. And then I, I feel like around like the four to five month mark is when things started easing out. There was occasionally parts where like portions of my breast I wouldn't be able to feel, but for the most part I was able to feel everything again. And now everything's back to normal. I can, my nipples feel totally normal. My breasts feel totally normal. I, don't, I didn't lose any sensation, obviously. Um, I can still touch everything. I can still feel everything. Now, Kristen Leanne, if you watch her video that she actually just posted about her breast augmentation update, she had the reverse effect where she didn't lose sensation. Her nipples were just like way overly sensitized and they still are to this day. And we had our breast augs done around the same time. Yeah, so it's it, every person's recovery is totally different. I, 
I'm totally fine now. I didn't lose total sensation, but it was, it was very weird going through that. But again, I knew that kind of getting into it and going back to breastfeeding. So can you guarantee that I'll be able to breastfeed by going through, you know, under the muscle. Cause a lot of people are like, well, I wanna go through the nipple so that way you can't see the scars when I'm in a, in a bikini, right? Cause people typically don't show their nipples when they're in a bikini. And it's the same thing when patients are like, do I do a lift or do I just do implants? When you're kind of on that borderline between do you need to have a lift or do you not need to have a lift? Some patients decide, well, I don't want to do the lift because I want to be able to breastfeed later on. And here's the deal guys, anytime that you are having any type of surgery, especially in this area, we can never guarantee that you're gonna be able to breastfeed. If you actually haven't had any kids in the past you don't have any experience with breastfeeding, whether or not you go through the areola or under the, the breast fold, you can't guarantee that you were ever even to breastfeed in the first place because you don't have experience with doing it. I have some patients who come in, they've never had kids and they have a breast augmentation and they can't breastfeed. I have the complete opposite. They've never had kids. They've had a breast augmentation and they can breastfeed. And then I have some parents who are like, I've had kids, I breastfed, they get their breast done, they can't breastfeed. But for the most part, if they go under the, under the, under the boob, they're still able to. Now, the, you have a higher likelihood of not being able to breastfeed if you go through the areola or if you have a lift, again, because you're cutting through more milk ducts in the area, but it's not a guarantee anyway. You have to know those risks going into it that yes, you are at a higher likelihood, but that doesn't mean that's going to cause you to not be able to breastfeed because you don't know if you even have the ability to breastfeed unless you have kids, unless you've done it before. So that was something that my consultant told me and that's something that I you know, go over with all patients and our surgeon goes over with all patients because that is a very true fact is, um, unfortunately, you just don't know until you know, <laughs> right? And that was a risk that I was willing to take because I don't know if I'll be able to breastfeed and who knows, I hope that I didn't, you know, screw that up. And I'm sure that if the time comes and I have a kid and I can't breastfeed, I'm sure that there's gonna be naysayers and haters out there who are just gonna be like, yep, you shouldn't have had a breast augmentation because you can't breastfeed your kid now. When realistically, I don't even know if I'm naturally able to do that right now anyway. Oh, this question. And I touched base on this question actually in my life update video. This isn't even so much on my own personal Instagram account. This is just from patients that come into my office. I get a lot of questions over people asking like random things like saline versus silicone or BII or these random questions because they saw it from an influencer, because they watched an influencer's YouTube channel, because they saw an influencer on Instagram. So I wanted to throw this in here on my thoughts involving influencers providing information regarding breast procedures when they don't work in the field. Um, and I say that because I'm not, I'm not an influencer, but I am still out here to provide you guys with information. Just know that yes, I do work in the plastic surgery industry. Yes, I do find myself to be an expert in breast augs and plastic surgery procedures because I do work in the field, but I am in no way as much of an expert as my surgeon or as pe much as people who have worked in this field longer than I have, because I've only been in this field for about six about seven months at this point. So there's still a lot of things that I have to learn, but I have a lot more experience with it than a random influencer who's only had her breast done once or twice, or whatever the case is. And the reason I bring this up is because again, and I mentioned this in my life update video, but there is an influencer who now lives in Houston who had her breasts redone by a surgeon who's in the Houston area and not by the place that I work in nor by the person who I actually went to get my breast augmentation done with. Um, but she documented her whole journey on Instagram, which is fantastic but she keeps giving out false information regarding breast procedures um, such as then again i mentioned this before i guess a follower of hers of hers had asked aren't you concerned about breast implant illness or aren't you concerned about getting sick from having silicone implants and this influencer's response was oh well if you're worried about getting sick from silicone implants just get saline implants saline implants are safer and i want to be like Oh no, no, no. Like that is such a misconception. That's, that's such false information to tell people that saline implants are safer than silicone implants. It's such an old wives tale. This isn't 1995 or 2001 anymore, right? Back in those days, you could potentially say that saline implants were safer than silicone implants because if a silicone implant back then ruptured in your body, actual silicone gel would leak out in your body. Whereas if you rupture a saline implant, salt water would leak out into your body. But the reason that people are asking this is because they it has nothing to do with rupturing, right? We all know that gummy bear implants can't rupture. It's a gummy bear implant or cohesive gel object. If a silicone implant nowadays ruptures, there's nothing that can come inside of your body. It's just, it's there's nothing to come out. <laughs> That's not the reason that people are asking. The reason that people are asking is because they think that silicone implants are linked to something called breast implant illness, which I talked about in my previous video, and that is not the case, okay? I talked about my previous video, so I'm not gonna go off on a rant about it, but 
what you guys need to understand is that saline implants still are a silicone encasement filled with saline solution. So regardless of whether you choose a saline implant or a silicone implant, you're still putting silicone in your body because the saline solution needs to be filled in something. It's not a metal container that goes in your body. It's not a plastic bag that goes in your body. It is a silicone encasement that is once implanted in your body, they fill with the saline solution to get the desired effect that you want. Whereas a silicone implant is already in its natural shape before it's put in your body. So regardless, girl, you're putting silicone implants in your body. So please, I'm sure she's not even watching this video, please stop telling people that saline implants are safer than silicone because they're not. And if anything, most patients get sil silicone implants because they're better feeling. They last, from what I understand, a little bit longer. And honestly, if we're, one were to quote unquote rupture, which is so highly unlikely for a silicone implant to ever rupture, if in the off chance that it was to rupture, there's nothing to spill out. So unlike saline, whereas if a saline implant ruptures, you're gonna have one really small boob and one really big boob, that won't happen with silicone because there's nothing to happen, nothing, nothing happens, nothing spills out, right? So yeah, that, I think, I think listening to influencers is fantastic. I think doing your research is fantastic, but you need to go into an understanding that their experience that they're providing to you is just that. It's the experience that they've had with getting the procedure done. Um, and if they're telling you guys facts about a breast augmentation, just understand that they might not be facts, especially like you shouldn't be asking an influencer which one is safer because that person just went through getting a breast augmentation. They don't actually know the facts involved. You should be asking your surgeon these questions, not an influencer who was probably paid to get that procedure done. I feel like there was another, oh, there was. My recommendations for somebody who wants to have a fat transfer instead of getting implants. Um, and what they're talking about is a fat transfer to their breasts as opposed to implants, because I think Kylie Jenner at one point had, had had a fat transfer to her breasts as opposed to implants, because for years she was accused of having implants, but she came back and she was like, no, I never had implants. Her boobs magically got bigger. It's because she had a fat transfer. And what happens when you have a fat transfer to your breasts? It's the same thing as when you have a fat transfer to any other area in your body. If you're like getting a BBL, you need to take fat out of one area to put it in another. I don't have specific thoughts about it, I think that if you really wanted to get fat transfer, that's totally fine. I will tell you that the results of having a fat transfer are very unpredictable compared to implants, right? Like if you have an implant, you know that you're gonna have, like me, 400 cc's added into your body. So you know that over time, you're always gonna have 400 cc's in your body. Whereas with a fat transfer, you have to physically, or your surgeon has to physically remove the fat from certain areas of your body and then put that fat back into your breast. And throughout, the time or throughout the procedure of removing the fat cells and putting it back into your breast, there's a lot of time involved in that and a lot of the fat cells actually can die off. They might not necessarily die off immediately, but they can die off even once they're implanted into your breast and there's no way for a surgeon to really know how much tissue will die in that process. Is it possible for it to happen? Like, is it possible for you to have an amazing results with a fat transfer? Absolutely, of course. Can you guarantee symmetry? No, because there is a higher likelihood that one of your breasts could end up bigger than the other one just because you don't know how much of that fat tissue is actually going to survive after it goes through the fat transfer. And with a fat transfer, you do have to have liposuction in order to get it put back into your body because you can't remove fat from the body without doing liposuction, which will actually increase the cost of your procedures. Um, and I always kind of question patients who want to do a fat transfer as opposed to having implants because typically there is another underlying reason as to why they don't want to have implants and I just like to address those reasons prior to providing them with no you shouldn't get a fat transfer um, or yes you should only get implants right like if they really truly have a fear of implants you it's probably better for that person to be able to make whatever decision they want regarding their body <laughs> right because that person's always going to question things that they already are convinced that implants are toxic or whatever the case is which is just, it's, it's not the case but um, just so you guys are aware that's kind of what I know about fat transfers I've never experienced one but that's typically that's all I know about it. Um, what else? Things, things, things. Oh, recommendations. I don't really have much more on my list of things, but recommendations, like girl to girl recommendations on things that I wish I had known or have done differently when I was going through my augmentation of my recovery journey is I spent so much money on buying brand new bras a month after surgery because my breasts look so good. They look so perky. They were so fresh, so clean. And I just love them. I, I, I love them after one month. And I went out and I bought all brand new sports bras and all brand new bras. And boy, oh boy, do I wish I had not spent that money. Why? 
because your body is still healing three to six months after surgery. And even though my breasts look so good and I loved how they looked, my breasts were still really swollen. Um, not noticeably, like visually noticeably between one month and three months, I couldn't really tell a huge difference in the sizing, but I bought all brand new bras. I had to have spent like three to four hundred dollars in brand new bras because I got so excited not all at once but over the course of a couple of weeks two months after buying them I couldn't fit into them um, and my recommendation to you guys is you know hold off on buying really expensive bras until after at least three months after your procedure because I bought all brand new bras in a size small and your girl is normally an extra small and to be honest even though my my breasts are quite a bit larger than they were previously I actually can fit in most of my sports bras still from obviously before having surgery because my, my band right here, like the width of my body hasn't changed. My cup size has obviously changed, but not my width of my, my band size. So um, a lot of bras that I did size up in no longer fit. And honestly, I think I was like, a, I measured like a 32 triple D or 32, I don't know, 32 like G or something like that for an actual cup size. And that went down and now, in case you guys were wondering, prior to surgery, I was around a 32, 34 B cup. Depending upon where you shop, keep that in mind because bra size is completely dependent upon where you shop. I am now a 32 triple D in Victoria's Secrets, which is a 32 double D if you go to like anywhere else, a Target. Walmart, whatever the case is. So um, I went up quite a few quite a few bra sizes, just so you guys are aware. But my recommendation, hold off on buying really good bras until you're at least three months in the clear, just to save you guys the heartache of purchasing all these cute bras that won't fit later on. Other recommendations? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like that's kind of it, guys. I mean, I went through all the questions that I got in Instagram when I was kind of going through some things, questions that I get asked on a daily basis. Um, especially doing part one and now obviously this video. I feel like I answered a lot of things that I would like to have known prior to getting into surgery. So if you guys do have additional questions that I didn't answer or just things that you might want to know and you want me to answer them in either a separate video or whatever the case is, feel free to leave them in the comment box down below. I will try to get back to everybody, whether it's individually or if I get more than a handful, I'll just create a whole new video for you guys. Or you can always go to hit me up on DM on Instagram. I will tell you for some reason, a lot of my DMs, if you're you're not following me on Instagram, they actually go to like a private folder, which I only check like once a week. So don't feel bad. I, I will get back to you, I promise. But I have connected with a lot of women over there over the past couple of months and um, they always seem really grateful for it. So you can always hit me up over there. And that's really all I got, guys. I hope that you did like this two part series. Again, I apologize that it had to be in two parts, but it's a lot of information to kind of just throw into one video. So um, thank you guys so much for watching and that's it. I hope you all have a great day, great night and enjoy whatever it is that you are doing at this very moment. <laughs> Bye guys.